Dr. Richard Cohn and Dr. Martin Cook. Dr. Cohn is Chairman, Curriculum in Peace, War and Defense, as well as Professor of History at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the Executive Secretary, Triangle uh, Institute for Security Studies. He received the AB from Harvard College and the MS and PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Among numerous professional responsibilities and honors, he has served as visiting scholar in strategic studies, SAIS, John Hopkins University, adjunct professor, National War College, chief of Air Force history and chief historian, U.S. Air Force, and the Harold Keith Johnson Visiting Chair of Military History, U.S. Army Military History Institute and Army War College. He is the author of numerous books and publications, including one that is very appropriate to our subject, Tarnished Brass, Is the U.S. Military Profession in Decline, which was published in the spring 2009 edition of World Affairs. Joining in the dialogue is our own Dr. Martin Cook, who has received his PhD in philosophy from the University of Chicago and is the Admiral James Bond Stockdale Professor of Professional Military Ethics. He has previously served as Professor of Philosophy at the Deputy Department Head, Department of Philosophy at the United States Air Force Academy, <coughs> Professor of Ethics at the, and, and the Root Chair of Military Studies at the U.S. Army War College, and as a tenured member of the faculty at Santa Clara University. Dr. Cook serves as editor of the Journal of Military Ethics and as a member of the editorial board of Parameters. He has authored two books, co-authored the third, and has over 35 scholarly articles. He has lectured on topics of military ethics in the United Kingdom, Australia, Singapore, and Norway. His most recent book, The Moral Warrior, Ethics and Service in the U.S. Military, was published in 2003 and is now undergoing revision. Gentlemen, thank you both, and we look forward to your dialogue. Thanks, John. Um, we've asked Dick to be here today because uh, for a very long time, he has been uh, very strenuously arguing that we, are, uh, as a culture, are seriously confused about proper subordination of the military to constitutional authority. Um, you had as one of your two read-aheads for this conference the piece Tarnished Brass that was just referred to. Um, as I mentioned on day one, that piece got the attention of CNO, uh, and in fact, uh, Admiral Weiskopf was charged to draft a formal response on the part of the Navy to that piece. So uh, the plan for the morning is Dick is going to give a, a fairly extensive paper. Uh, I plan mostly to chime in and raise a few point, counterpoint kinds of considerations. Uh, I myself published a piece called uh, The Revolt of the Generals, an Ethical Analysis in Parameters a few years ago in which I grudgingly defended the actions of these retired generals criticizing uh, the Bush-Iraq policy. Uh, Dick and I are certainly going to disagree about that. Um, uh, but uh, I, I made that argument with great trepidation, so let me be clear at the outset, we're in violent agreement on the basic point, which is that uniformed officers on active duty must absolutely be subordinate to civilian authority. That, on that, there is really no serious dispute between us. Um, so the range of disagreement we may artificially exaggerate for effect, but it's not that large. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me turn the floor over to Dick. Is that similar to firing for effect uh, <laughs> in a naval sense, Martin? Well, I want to thank John and Martin and Admiral Wisecup and, and uh, the faculty at uh, the Naval War College uh, for holding this conference and inviting me to participate. Uh, just one, one caveat, I'm no longer chair of Peace, War, and Defense or director of the Triangle Institute. Um, I don't want to, to uh, get in the way of my distinguished colleagues who, who took my place in those two institutions. Civilian control of the military has presented a challenge to American officers since the early days of the Republic. You know, George Washington chafed um, under the difficulties of responding to the desires and dictates of the Continental Congress, and in addition, those of the state governors, for while they were not formally his superiors, he operated in their sovereign territory, and their govern governments were sovereign under the Articles of Confederation. And he depended on them for soldiers, militia, supplies, and other support throughout the war for independence. 
Washington had to suppress revolts by portions of his army. And at the end of the war, a movement among his own officers, either to refuse to fight or to disband, if so ordered, because his officers had become so anxious and angry over demobilization without assurances that they would receive the pay they had earned and the half pay that they were promised. The Constitution was written a mere five years after the war ended. It enshrined civilian supremacy over the military as a basic foundation of American government and the keystone of military service for all American soldiers in the generic sense soldiers, militia and regular, temporary, uh, temporarily embodied civilians and long service professionals. Every individual in every generation and every military unit ever since 1789 has affirmed or sworn to uphold that constitution, officers at commissioning, and then again every time they accept promotion. And I would charge you and the people uh, whom you lead and mentor to think about and talk about that oath every time you take it or you preside at a ceremony in which an officer does. The Constitution has subordinated every soldier on active duty to the president in the role of commander in chief, no matter who the president is or what he or she orders. It obligates every soldier to obey the laws of Congress on pain of punishment or prosecution and to accede to the judgment of military or civilian courts, thus all three branches. And yet the way civilian control and military subordination has played out historically and how it might operate during the careers of the officers and civilians in this room today is very much in my judgment misunderstood or even contested. For the realities of the relationship affected as they are by the people and circumstances at any given time and in any particular situation have not been well studied historically nor are they as predictable as one might think in an uncertain future. Often they are simply forgotten or ignored. In the, in the late summer of 1983, when as Chief of Air Force History, I argued with a major on the air staff over the wording of an historical appendix to a new version of Air Force Manual 1-1, I concluded one frustrating telephone conversation by saying, well, you know, 1-1 is a derivative document. Derivative of what, he exclaimed, incredulous that I seemed unaware that it was the functional doctrine, foundational doctrine for the whole U.S. Air Force. Well, the Constitution, for one, I replied, to which I heard a sigh that suggested a reaction of, oh, that, of course, but how is that relevant? And my reaction was, tell me how it's irrelevant. Uh, it means you have to tell the truth, be accurate and truthful and not warp the history to the advantage of the United States Air Force's roles, missions, and budget, which is what was implied in our conversations. In late 1992, having won the presidential election and promised to abolish the ban on military service by homosexuals, Bill Clinton faced the concerted opposition of the Joint Chiefs and virtually the entire military establishment. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs General Colin Powell did not mention this spreading controversy or the emerging defiance in the ranks at his first meeting with the president-elect. He didn't offer, raise the issue, offer to help or advise. General Powell was enormously popular after what appeared at the time to be a stunning victory in the Persian Gulf War the year before. He let the possibility of mass resignation by the chiefs and many other officers hang threateningly in the air, the superheated air that developed almost immediately, and eventually negotiated compromise across the table with Mr. Clinton that abandoned Clinton's promise and looked to everyone at the time and since as a defeat for the new president at the hands of the military leadership. Almost no one framed this confrontation in the context of civilian control or military subordination, which is my point. Certainly not General Powell, either in statements at the time or in his memoirs later, quite the opposite, as I'll speak later. And few, if any, press or pundits and commentators mentioned it. Incredibly, no one in the political leadership of either party, at least publicly, labeled the defiance of the American military as a problem for the American tradition and practice 
of civilian control. At least three points seem important to make at the beginning of any exploration of military ethics and professionalism involved in civilian control. First is that historically there has been considerable and regular conflict between the top military leadership and its civilian superiors in American history. Not simply the well-known instances of insubordination like George McClellan's reluctance to fight during the Civil War or Douglas MacArthur's ignoring and undermining of President Harry Truman's policies and orders that first year of the Korean War, both instances when presidents sacked their generals, but regular tension, disagreement, distrust, and conflict that sometimes went up to the line of insubordination, what my colleague Peter Fever calls shirking on the part uh, of military subordinates. Second, there are no standard or cookbook principles or checklists of military or civilian behaviors that will either avoid conflict or assure the proper functioning of civilian control in all instances, even as I've tried to come up with such a list in a recent publication. The two sides come from different worlds. They have different needs in both peace and war, and often they have little preparation or experience or understanding that equips them for dealing with the other in what are often situations of extraordinary pressure and stress. Third, there is no sure way to prepare for these situations beyond this. First, imbuing the military with a conscious and unshakable commitment to civilian control, which I think the American military possesses in principle and in theory. But in addition, providing officers with a solid historical understanding of how it has functioned in the United States and suggesting in various scenarios, both contemporary and hypothetical, that might occur and how it might be handled to improve the changes for both civilian control and policies and decisions that best serve the nation's security and interests. And I'll try to do that at the end of this paper. Now, the system of civilian control worked pretty well in this country until after World War II. The separation and overlapping of authority over the military and the Constitution kept civilians, kept civilians from using the military illegally. The reverence for the Constitution and for law in the population, the keeping of the professional military small, the reliance on citizen soldiers for defense and their mobilization in wartime, and then demobilization, and the embracing of civilian control by the military has kept the officer corps not only in check, but unwilling ever, except in a, a very few instances of even openly defying civilian authority or even contemplating it. The conflicts until the 1940s had been almost always personal over a policy or a decision involving personal ambition or honest differences of judgment, sometimes bitter, sometimes undermining American war making, but rarely elevated to the level of issues of civilian control or military subordination. That changed after World War II, as Jim Burke has suggested in his paper on Tuesday, with the changes in the nature of the American military and its role in American life. And since that time, the last 65 years, that's a long time, civilian control has declined or eroded in the United States. Certainly the military obeys direct orders and remains within the law. Instances of public disagreement or defiance have been rare, but beneath the surface, by leaks, by mobilizing, contractors and congressmen and retired officers and local partisans and veterans groups and lobbying organizations, by framing the issues certain ways, by using their reputation for disinterested patriotism and the high esteem or prestige that the military enjoys with the public since the mid-1980s. The military leadership has largely gotten its way stymied decisions it opposed, achieved its budgets, and controlled its own destiny to a degree that would not have surprised, but would definitely have disturbed 
the people who founded the United States. It began with the three-year battle over unification of the services in the 1940s. Beginning in the 1880s, some 60 years before, each of the services had begun to develop very specific understandings of their roles in national defense and develop doctrines of war fighting that shaped their size, organization, and weapons systems. Each had forged alliances among powerful interests in the country, not least, I might remind this audience, the Navy with the steel industry in the 1880s and 1890s. Each had created effective public relations offices and become skilled at influencing Congress and communicating with the public. In the case of the Army Air Corps between the two world wars, they were willing, even in the pursuit of service independence, to engage in open insubordination. I remind you of the Billy Mitchell trial, guerrilla politics, and the extremities of propaganda about air power to get their way. So when in the wake of World War II, when new weapons, a different and worldwide threat, and the changed role of the United States in world politics threw the traditional relationships of the services into doubt, there broke out the most vicious inter-service battle in American history, a public one that neither Congress or President Truman could control or resolve as the services fought each other over the power of the new Department of Defense, their roles and missions, the divvying up of limited budgets, strategy, policy, and weapon system. We revere Harry Truman, the decisive, the buck stops here. But I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, he, he, he could not stop the buck from talking for itself from the new Pentagon building. Korea exacerbated these tensions. Truman had to fire his theater commander, Douglas MacArthur, perhaps the most famous, most distinguished, and most seemingly independent, schemingly independent military officer of the era and perhaps American history. President Eisenhower could do no better. He replaced his chiefs early in his administration. He fought with their replacements over budgets and strategy. He brought, when he didn't renew uh, General Ridgway, he brought General Maxwell Taylor in his office and said, now here are the policies, are you going to follow them? Maxwell Taylor said, of course, Mr. President, and then proceeded to undermine them uh, as much as possible in the interest uh, of saving the Army. Written up by a fine historian in the Journal of Military History, this whole uh, episode, he considered the last year in office firing his Air Force chief. He called his chief's behavior at that point, quote, damn near treason, unquote. He left office warning the nation about the danger of misplaced power, quote, sought or unsought, unquote, in the military industrial complex. This from the only professional officer to hold the presidency in the 20th century. Amazingly, things worsened in the Kennedy-Johnson administration in the 1960s. Kennedy felt betrayed by the military uh, advice of the chiefs in the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961, and the chiefs lost all confidence in him for not sending in U.S. forces which were offshore to bail out the Cuban exiles. Kennedy rejected in disdain military advice during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He installed, uh, he, in the Johnson administration, retained the most respected young business leader of the age, Robert McNamara, to bring the Pentagon to heel. And McNamara, by seizing control of the programming, policy, but strategy, and budgeting, and synchronizing them uh, with a force structure and weapon systems, became the most consequential and influential Secretary of Defense in the history of the office. But his arrogance, his lying, his ignoring and disparaging of, mi of the military so soiled the process, provoked such hatred in return, that civil-military relations, in a sense, have never recovered. The worst problem was Vietnam, and that problem was not too much civilian control. It was the wrong civilian control, picking targets of airplanes instead of really overseeing uh, General Westmoreland's strategy and, and asking for accountability. Um, you know the story of the lying and the distrust on both sides and the resulting disaster uh, of Vietnam. The result of this early history was that civil and military essentially lost all trust in each other. Each viewed the other's power with great fear. The relationship often became one of mutual 
manipulation as it had been in the recent past. Civilians lost the power of firing senior officers without real public cause and even then considerable a political cost. They lost the power to control leaks or end runs to Congress or to control the public relations machines and alliances of the services with their contractors and base communities and the like. I remember uh, in 1971 a brilliant a piece of journalism by CBS News called The Selling of the Pentagon. Uh, I would go back to those of you interested in public affairs and civil military relations and view a tape of that Bob Schieffer report. Uh, I was already interested in civil military relations in 1971 in my new job uh, as an assistant professor at CCNY and I was struck by the cogency. It's, it's a little bit uh, inflammatory journalism but then you've had some recent experience with that in this room. <laughs> <coughs> Civilians had to negotiate with the military over budgets, weapons, bases, and even policies and de decisions over interventions. The Don't Ask, Don't Tell in the 1990s was emblematic. Bill Clinton intervened and used the military overseas more than any of his predecessors, but it was always a negotiation over rules of engagement, size, duration, orders. The joke at the time was the military would say to the president, the answer is 500,000 troops for five years. Now what's the question? <laughs> Certainly the military remained subordinate. The civilians chose the senior people for promotion and jobs. They decided the big issues, approved the budget. But the trend clearly beginning with the 1947 reorganization of the national security governmental apparatus was to increase military influence to unprecedented levels and more disturbing, a loss of understanding in all this bureaucratic maneuvering of the understanding of civilian control and the proper behaviors necessary for it to operate and play out on the part of the military leadership. Now, I'm not blaming anyone, even for the manipulation on both sides or the fear of each on both sides or the policies that resulted. These things are structural, these things are bureaucratic. Civilians in our system of government, as you see every day if you read the newspapers, have to struggle to exert their influence and achieve policy outcomes, not to speak of their own ambitions, but for office. When you think our government is paralyzed, remember it is paralyzed just as the framers designed it. A government is designed not to be efficient. It is designed uh, to, to, to be kept because of internal struggle from oppressing the population. And it's been pretty good at that. We have pretty extensive liberty in this country. The military, after 20 years of inter-service war, grave threats, interventions and wars, partisan bickering and limited budgets by the 1960s, had to learn to struggle to get the resources to accomplish their mission, to get the people and weapons they need to meet the requirements that the civilian government levies upon them. And believe me, dealing with Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon would turn you into a bureaucratic, political, Machiavellian military officer too, unless you were armored against it by your professionalism, your ethics, uh, and your understanding of civilian control. But the result of all this, besides an erosion of civilian control, has been a real decline in some aspects of military professionalism that, been, that has been at once both a result and a cause of the diminishing civilian control, a sort of mutual reinforcement that poses real challenges to you today as officers, your leaders, your, your civilian colleagues, and the functioning of our government and national security at the highest levels. First, some of this has not been, as I've explained, unprecedented but it has become regular and has become routinized. The rise of self-interested bureaucratic behavior, I've already mentioned. 
I remember ever giving a speech at the Army War College and an officer from an, uh, a service I will not name uh, said to me, you know, my job as a member of the lia legislative liaison for my service was to go up on Capitol Hill and restore $2 billion that OSD had cut out of our budget. You have to remember how uh, Admiral Crow in his memoirs described how he under the table supported Goldwater Nichols in 1985 and 1986 when his Secretary of Defense and the Chiefs were publicly opposed to it. You have to look at the quotes in General Powell's memoirs. He said that as a White House fellow, a major, he learned uh, in, in the cabinet department with which he was working that in the American government, quote, you never know what you can get away with until you can try, until you try, unquote. Is that proper military subordination? He also said that we in the Vietnam generation were determined never again, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, never again to uh, be, be dragged into a war in which there was you know, no strategy and no, no uh, public support. Uh, and we, made, we vowed that when our turn came, we would make sure that would not happen. Second, I've argued there's been a decline in strategic excellence in the armed services, be in part be because of this uh, bureaucratic behavior. Uh, I raised in the, that in the article you read. There are many reasons, but I didn't mention in the article the distrust and sometimes dysfunctional civil-military relationship that often has to produce the strategy and the policy and the agreement uh, in, at the top of the government. A third problem is politicization, the growth in partisanship in the military uh, and the decline um, in the independence or non-affiliation of serving officers with political identification. And with that comes a growing preference for certain policy or political outcomes, a spreading misunderstanding, if you will, that the role of the military goes beyond advice to civilian leadership and then execution of lawful orders, to striving for particular policy outcomes and decisions and preferences. And part of it originates, it seems to me, a point that Jim made in his uh, uh, paper, from the belief of an all-volunteer army, armed force since the early 1970s, that it is smarter than the civilians, more experienced uh, than the civilians, and morally superior to the civilians uh, in their disinterested uh, patriotism, etc., as though senior military uh, officers don't have, in some respects, the same kinds of ambitions uh, for uh, responsibility uh, and rank in our political and military system. And last, a growing willingness to push back, to stymie, to paralyze, to oppose, to undermine civilian leadership. It's good, it's necessary, and it is an obligation of military officers to be candid and even to confront the civilians when they're about to do something dumb or dysfunctional. It's part of advice, it's part of the advisory role, but it's not proper to insist on the military viewpoint um, either directly or through a bureaucratic ledger domain or to circumvent or oppose or shirk. It's not proper to resign from office or to ask to be replaced when you're having conflict with a civilian. It's the civilian's job to get rid of you, and I'll speak about that uh, at more length uh, in a bit. Now, I could give many instances of this uh, and statements of attitude. Even someone who tried as much as possible to be subordinate as Hugh Shelton uh, when he was uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs felt necessary to give a speech in early 2000 as the new national security strategy was being uh, revised, his famous Dover speech in which he warned the country and the political leadership publicly that when they made a decision, they had to be prepared to stand on the flight line as President Obama uh, just recently did 
when the coffins come back from the theater of operations. But my earlier point uh, about preparation for these kinds of struggles is that we need to teach by case studies, even recent ones when we don't have the full information as I'm going to do here. And I want to make these points to you not because you are going to be chairman of the Joint Chiefs or a combatant commander, but because I'm going to argue with you at the end of this talk of these case studies that the relationship between the senior military people and the civilians is actually no different than your relationships with your commanders and your superior officers at every level of service in your careers. The first one I would take is the revolt of the generals, forgetting when I wrote this that Martin had written on this subject, but I'll blame Martin. He asked me to address this case study. You remember in April of 2006 in the Iraq War, some half dozen uh, retired two-star generals plus uh, a three-star uh, uh, named Gregory Newbold, who was the J-3 on the Joint Chiefs and a Marine Lieutenant General, and another Marine, uh, Anthony Zinni, the retired CENTCOM commander, undertook a, a vicious public attack on Donald Rumsfeld's management of the war in Iraq, his strategic competence, uh, his goodwill, um, his insistent upon, insistence upon limiting the number of troops, his abusive behavior to his commanders, uh, mistaken strategy, um, and the failing strategy uh, in the Iraq War. Now, retired officers certainly have the right to speak their mind, uh, legal or right. They are still capable of being called back on active duty and they are still to some degree uh, operating under the uh, rules of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, by the way, uh, because they are on retirement, uh, accepting. Um, I'm not a lawyer, I don't want to get into the legalities of this. But more important are the professional norms that retired uh, senior officers uh, must operate under because the public does not distinguish retired generals from active duty generals. It's the military, thank you very much. It's the brass, thank you very much. My wife was responsible for that title, the tarnished brass. The editor and I couldn't come up with a title and she's right off the top of her head. She's a therapist, maybe that's why she was so adept at that. These, these officers were doing this five years into Mr. Rumsfeld's tenure while American forces were engaged in the very battles that they were speaking about. These officers had served, except for Zinni, under, on active duty, under Rumsfeld. Not directly, but General Baptiste, Baptiste who the, the Army Two Star, who had been the commander of the 1st Division in Iraq, had been uh, Secretary Wolfowitz's military assistant. One has to ask oneself, what is the effect on the policy of the president? What is the effect on civilian control when a group of five or six or eight or ten retired generals, even though as Rumsfeld pointed out, you have hundreds upon hundreds of retired admirals and generals do this. And it was not concerted. There was no conspiracy. These people just kind of fed off of each other. I wonder, and I never had the chance to ask him of General Batiste, whether he would have made those statements on the parade ground uh, in Germany when he uh, surrendered command of the 1st Division uh, to his successor. Would he have made such a speech in front of the troops? Well, if you make it in the newspapers, how is that different from in front of the troops? It raises the issue of retired senior officers' behavior. And here I want to talk about the four stars, the retired four stars. At any given time, there are perhaps 200 plus of them. A great change has overtaken uh, these people, it seems to me. Uh, on the subject of, of political participation and intervention, if you will, in the politics of this nation at the presidential election level. We know there's a long history of the revolving door from the Pentagon to defense industries uh, 
um, and to other uh, prominent places in American uh, life. They can become powerful lobbyists. A recent article in, in the New York Times pointed out how, how many of them come back to the Pentagon and uh, using their contacts of people who had been their subordinates who are still on active duty, and they're being used uh, for uh, consulting work. There's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong is to use their influence on their successors to promote either their own profit or their employer's profit. And that, it seems to me, is, as one general said when 30 years ago, uh, when I was working for the Air Force, he said, you know about these rag outfits? I said, what do you mean? He said, rent a general. He was a retired three-star. His father had been a three-star, a West Point graduate. He understood exactly what was going on. And it, and it has s such that it is, is under legal um, um, legal protocols about what's proper uh, after you retire um, at certain levels in, in uh, lobbying uh, your successors. But what disturbs me more is the using of rank and for the prestige of the military uh, for partisan purposes. It's legal, but when retired four stars use the mantle of their uniform and their disinterested patriotism to endorse presidential candidates, which began publicly in 1988 uh, uh, but rose to prominence in 1992 when Admiral Crow endorsed and a few other uh, senior officers endorsed Bill Clinton. It escalated. Generals Powell and Schwarzkopf became Republicans, prominent the 96 Republican presidential convention, General Shalikash Wiesley in, in 04. General Sanchez gave the uh, Democratic response to a presidential, uh, a Saturday presidential radio address in 2006 and said that he was not doing this as a Democrat or as a partisan, but it's the opposition party's response. What this does is it misleads people on active duty to think it's okay to be partisan. More importantly, it corrupts civil military relations. It destroys the trust between senior military people and the senior civilian officials, they'll begin to pick their generals and admirals for pliability. They won't be candid in decision making for fear that the military will tell tales out of school or leak things or, uh, or once they retire. It provides fodder for the opponents of policy or for the opposition party. It undermines the political leader's legitimacy in national security. Just as, as Admiral Crow, through the mantle of his own legitimacy over Bill Clinton, and removed his fitness for office uh, uh, as commander-in-chief from the political election. Opponents can destroy a president's or a secretary of defense's legitimacy in direct proportion to that individual's prestige. General Powell in 2008, breaking ranks with his party and endorsing <coughs> President Obama, Senator Obama. The retired Air Force Chief of Staff, Tony McPeak, traveling Iowa, introducing Senator Obama and giving him legitimacy in national security. And there is a fear among civilians that senior military people will resign. In fact, sometimes they are vetted for whether they would resign in, over disagreement of policy before they're appointed to office. I think it's wrong for senior people to resign. They can't, they shouldn't, they mustn't. It implies that they are the ones who should determine the policy or the decision instead of advising and then executing. The very threat undermines civilian control because it threatens to cause real political problems, particularly after the mid-1980s when the military rose to become the most prestigious and trusted institution in American public life. Resignation, even one, would erode trust further. Furthermore, resignation abandons one's troops. It undermines American war making. Resignation is exactly what the left wanted the military to do during the Vietnam War, to vote with their feet. The resignation of one of the chiefs would be a resignation 
The resignation of all six at once would be a military revolt. How then could their successors lead the force? How could they gain the confidence of the officers and enlisted men and women under their leadership throughout the worldwide American military? Now, you can in instances, and they've been very rare in American history, in which senior officers have asked for retirement early. General Fogelman, the chief of staff of the Air Force, did so in 1997. But he uh, eventually explained that he did not resign in protest, and he was absolutely silent on the, on the reasons for his leaving office in 1997. Admiral Fallon, in 2009, decided that he was a problem for the administration, he said, I guess I better retire, and Secretary Gates said, okay. He has been silent since. If you can't do it at the lower levels, how can you do it at the higher levels? The question is wartime. I remember asking Leon Johnson, who won the Medal of Honor <coughs> at Ploiesti in 1943, when he was a, a, a group commander in the uh, Army Air Forces, uh, he was briefed uh, by uh, uh, Colonel Jake Smart about the Smart had dreamed up this low-level mission. Johnson said to me later, with Smart in the room, these two old retired four-star telling me the history, Johnson said, I knew that wasn't going to work. I knew we were going to get shot to hell. And I said to him, well, General Johnson, why, why didn't you say something? He said, oh, I spoke up. I said, but you went into battle. He said, in 1943, what am I supposed to do? Refuse to fight? <laughs> West Point, class of 26? I'm going to resign? <laughs> well, is it different today? I, I don't know. You have to answer that question uh, for yourself. The second case is General Keene and General Odierno in 2006. How much time do I have left? Uh, Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. Um, Remember General Keene, ja Jack Keene, the retired four-star vice chief of staff of the uh, uh, Army, had retired in 2003. Rumsfeld had offered him uh, the chief of staff's office uh, after General Shinseki retired. He had accepted but then changed his mind because of his wife's uh, illness with Parkinson's disease. He was on the Defense Policy Board, that group of uh, advisors to the secretary. He decided in September of 2006 a growing feeling that we were losing the, 2000, uh, losing the Iraq War. He went to Secretary Rumsfeld and he explained it in excruciating and, and depressing detail to essentially no effect. But after Rumsfeld left office two months later, three months later, but was fired in November, General Keene began to drive the policy and strategy in Iraq as a retired four-star. He met with people planning a different strategy at the American Enterprise Institute. He briefed the president. He developed a channel to the vice president. He frequently called General Odierno, who wanted more troops. He had become, in November, the second in command in Iraq. General Casey, his boss, did not know of these calls, did not want more troops, wanted to keep to the, to the hue to the uh, strategy that they were following. General Keene and General Odierno, with malice aforethought, circumvented the chain of command. The next year, he was asked, General Keene, by Admiral Mullen as he took over as chairman of the Joint Chiefs, to quit doing this and to be silent. Keene refused. General Casey ordered General Odierno not to talk to General Petraeus after Petraeus had been named as Casey's successor. Not to talk to General Keene. Eventually, Admiral Mullen prohibited Admiral Keen, uh, General Keene from visiting the theater and advising General Petraeus, who took over for Casey. Keene had that reversed by going to the vice president and the president. Tom Ricks, in his reporting in uh, a recent book, quotes an officer in the Pentagon as saying that General Keene functioned essentially as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Ricks calls Keene's and Odierno's behavior a, quote, epic guerrilla war to reverse the strategy. <laughs> 
Joaquin created a direct line of communication between General Petraeus, the Vice President, and the President, and thus corrupted the chain of command through Admiral Fallon and the Secretary of Defense, and even Ad Admiral Mullen, who was not in the chain of command, but obviously involved as the primary advisor to the President by law. Now the fault of all this clearly is with the civilians, to be sure. It's a dysfunctional decision-making process. You know, to, 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 to order the Joint Staff let General Keene go over to Iraq as opposed to calling up Secretary Gates and Admiral Mullen and saying, what the hell are you doing? General Petraeus has the right to talk to and be advised by anybody he feels like. They didn't do that. I think the proper behavior in retirement cannot destroy the legitimacy and function of one's successors in the Pentagon. The civilians have the right to av advice, but what if the retired advice is wrong? They, he, he was asked by uh, General Pace and Admiral Mullen to stop doing this. And what about General Odierno? Was he not undermining his own commander in General Casey, who had asked him to stop by speaking to, to Petraeus? Would you engage in such behavior at your level in the armed forces? And what of General Petraeus, who, who, who has a long history of behaviors on his own account as a, a senior officer, developing his own political and media networks, as many generals do. He's a brilliant officer, and we're grateful to him, serving as he does today, but grateful to him for his achievements uh, in the Iraq War and his command today. But one has to question does he really always engage in the proper subordinate behaviors? It's a wonderful story I heard of uh, Admiral Mullen at a dinner party in uh, Washington. And the person next to him said, well, well, what do you do? And General Mullen said, or Admiral Mullen said, well, I'm, I'm the principal military advisor to the president. And this woman said, oh, I apologize to General Petraeus. I, I didn't recognize you. I think his testimony in 2007 was brilliant and proper, but the back channels, the undermining of his predecessor in Iraq, and then his back channels with Keene in 2007 and 2008 are questionable. They're of a peach piece with his ad advice to, to General Shelton in early, 2000 and, in early 2000 that he should give the Dover speech. It's of a piece with uh, publishing an op-ed on the great success of the training of the Iraqi ar army during the presidential election of 2004. General Petraeus is part of the third case study, the last fall's Afghanistan decision, which began with the leak in late August last year uh, by the new, of the new commander's assessment of the situation in Afghanistan. Now, the president had run an Afghan review in February and March on coming into office. He had run for office promising to focus on Afghanistan as the necessary war, and he has. There have been many, 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 many more drone strikes in Pakistan, for example, under President Obama than there was uh, already, uh, than there was through the entire Bush uh, administration. He had appointed a special envoy in, in, in Holbrook. He had put a new commander out there in General McChrystal. He had put a military, uh, ex-military commander in Afghanistan in General Eikenberry in as ambassador to Afghanistan. When they reviewed the policy in February and March of 2009, they embraced a counterinsurgency strategy and they added 21,000 troops, which almost, uh, almost doubled the American troops in Afghanistan. <laughs> General Petraeus and Ad, uh, uh, now the, uh, the um, uh, CENTCOM commander was involved in that discussion. I think General McChrystal did his job. It was a cold, smart, candid review. He had been told what the strategy was and he merely said this is what it would take to implement it. But the leak I don't know how you would hang a serving somebody for leaking like that. It's possible that the administration did it because it redounded to its advantage, but it's unlikely that they did. I think the leaker should be prosecuted. 
And I can't believe it was done below the general officer level or ambassadorial level. It provoked a review in which, obviously, to me at least, the administration had buyer's remorse. They decided that the counterinsurgency strategy would be a full counterinsurgency strategy would be too costly in money, time, people, might not work given the dysfunctionality of the Afghan government, and in any event would not be supported either by the President's party in Congress or by the American people because during the summer, as that right before the assessment was leaked, it was clear that the support for the war in Congress and the public was going south. And one can imagine President Obama looking, saying, is this what I bought? Is this what you people advised me to do back in February and March? And so since we don't know, one has to ask the question, was it really explained to the President and his administration in absolute, clear, stark terms what a full counterinsurgency strategy would require over the long haul. The President's national security advisors, General Jones, a very distinguished, trustworthy, retired four-star Marine. One has to ask, was it fully explained to, the, or, or was it the change in public opinion that caused the buyer, a buyer's remorse, or the frankness of just how uh, dysfunctional the Afghan uh, government uh, has been? General Petraeus has been amazingly silent since the Obama administration has come into office for a senior commander. I think it's absolutely proper, but it has not been his MO uh, for much of his career. When General McChrystal, after the leak, made the uh, grave mistake of giving that speech at the uh, IISS in London and then other public uh, uh, statements which, which in effect jammed the president use Bob Woodward's term uh, on the uh, news, the news uh, show with George Stephanopoulos. One wonders, one wonders what kind of advice General McChrystal is taking, getting, or whether all those years in the special operations highly secret community had really prepared him to be a theater commander under such politically charged circumstances as has occurred uh, in, in this uh, recent environment. What I make from this history is several points, and then I'll close with these. I think that the ethics and professionalism of the American military is no different at the most senior levels than it is at every level where officers serve. First and foremost, to be competent at their jobs, whatever those jobs are, and to do their duty to the very best of their ability. Second of all, to be loyal, loyal to the, their superiors and loyal down the chain of command to the people below them. Third of all, in dealing with their, with their superiors, to build trust. It is the loss of trust, it seems to me, and it is trust, in fact, that is at the heart of the uh, service academy's honor codes and systems. Trust is necessary in battle. Trust is necessary in staff work and in policy and decision making. And it is up to the responsibility of the military to build trust, particularly after 60 years of a loss of trust uh, in many respects uh, in the government. Then there's the requirement to speak truth to power and to volunteer the truth when you see something wrong. Now, as one of my friends who served high in the Bush administration said, you can speak truth to power, but when you do it every day, you tend to lose your credibility. And that's true. One has to pick one's spots, as George Marshall understood. He said, I was never contentious. Uh, my staff wanted me to intervene constantly on this, that, or that, but I saved myself for the big issues. And then I think it's a responsibility of officers to keep quiet and execute orders, not un a lawful orders, and I remind everyone, and not to try to impose their own morality or policy preferences or assessments of the situation 
on their superiors when their superiors have decided otherwise. Perhaps close with a quotation from Omar N. Bradley, the first chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who said in his memoirs, I learned as a young officer to uh, do my duty, keep quiet, and keep my name out of the papers. Perhaps that's a good professional ethic that we might reconstitute. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Dick. And uh, I think you can see why uh, we saved Dick to bat cleanup here for the conference, because nobody has for so long done such a good job trying to restore a clear understanding of these issues. Uh, in our public debate than he has. So thank you very much for being here and we're very grateful. Uh, I don't want to so much object as to raise some additional considerations in case this isn't complicated enough. Um, I wanna start with um, two major figures or authors that have greatly affected this debate and talk a little about them for a minute. The first is now Brigadier General H.R. McMaster of the U.S. Army. Uh, when McMaster was a major, I'm sure almost everyone in this room knows, he wrote a doctoral dissertation, which resulted in a published book called uh, Dereliction of Duty, Lyndon Johnson, Robert McNamara, and the Lies that Led to Vietnam. Uh, and in that book, at least as most people read it, McMaster argues that the chiefs were entirely passive during the Johnson administration um, and failed to push back aggressively with firm professional military advice that might have prevented the worst disasters of the Vietnam era. Um, and General Zinni recounts that when Hugh Shelton was the chairman, he sent a copy of this book to all of the four stars in all of the services and told them that, that they were ordered to read it, um, called them to Washington, and according to Zinni, said, let's all agree that we'll never let anything like this happen on our watch. Um, and so the take away from that story, and Zinni has said regarding the Iraq war, it's time for the second edition of the book, um, that the planning was so poor in that case that it reflects uh, um, poorly, first of all, on the, on the senior leaders who actually planned it, uh, in particular General Franks, uh, but also reflects very poorly on the way that this dialogue was conducted between civilians and the military leaders of the country. Now. Um, the, the reverse question is, uh, even if they'd been firmer, clearer, more accurate in their assessment, uh, more intelligent, it's not obvious that President Bush and Secretary McNamara, uh, Secretary uh, Rumsfeld would have listened. Um, and uh, General Myers, um, I must admit, I, I, who was then the chairman, as you recall, uh, was basically a potted plant who would stand to, to the right of uh, Secretary Rumsfeld on public occasions. Now, uh, my perception then was that Myers was extremely passive and uh, didn't, was not doing a very good job, to be blunt about it, in terms of pushing back. Uh, Dick published a piece with General Myers in which they articulated that what all, uh, all happened and says that my perceptions were, in fact, inaccurate. And I had the opportunity to sit at NDU uh, a few months ago with General Myers in which he really explained his thinking, and it was exactly thinking along the lines that Dick has uh, articulated, that I, behind closed doors I said what I could, but uh, uh, the, the secretary and the president decided what they wanted to do, and my job was to keep quiet. Um, they had decided what the, what the plan was. So I think this is one set of areas where we might want to debate whether this is happening. I had the privilege of being on a panel with uh, HR uh, just last week in San Diego, and I pressed him on this point, whether that was a fair interpretation of his book, that in fact, it should, that the Iraq war is an occasion for a second edition, and the same kind of argument. And essentially, he said, yeah, uh, I think it was that bad. It was, it was on the same order of the kind of mistakes that we made in Vietnam. So I put, wanna put that on the table. I don't know for sure, so what from that, but um, it does trouble me. The other figure I want to mention is Don Snyder from the U.S. Army, retired colonel, uh, who uh, convened a project that uh, got together 40 or 50 scholars for a series of conferences. I was privileged to be one of them, uh, culminating in the publication of a book called The Future of the Army Profession. Um, 
No matter what your service is, I highly commend that book to you um, because it was, uh, Don's sense was that the Army uh, Officer Corps was losing its sense of professionalism in a very specific sense. His going in question was, is military officership uh, a matter of being a member of a profession or is it merely being a member of an obedient bureaucracy? Um, and his sense was that the military was shifting toward being merely an obedient bureaucracy. Now, Dick might say it's a disobedient bureaucracy, uh, but in any case, uh, it's more bureaucratic than it is professional. And what did he mean by that? He meant, first of all, that, um, that professions, as we talked about on day one, have a body of expert knowledge, uh, which they uh, hold uniquely and which defines uh, what they can and should do. Let me give you a simple example from another profession that will make it easy. There are some things, one would hope, that a professional physician would not do under any circumstance. Uh, even if they work within a bureaucracy like Kaiser Permanente or something like that, there is a sense that there are some things you simply can't tell a professional to do uh, because in their professional judgment it is totally unacceptable. Um, um, now, the trouble here, of course, is that military officers are professionals, if they are, in a somewhat different sense than those doctors. Um, um, so, but the, the problem that drove my Revolt of the Generals paper was uh, what happens when uh, you disagree with what you're being told to do as a military professional, not because you don't like the policy or because you personally disagree or because you have some idiosyncratic reason for disapproving of it, but because uh, to, to the core of your professional judgment, this makes no sense. This makes no sense what, whatsoever. Now, Dick argues very cogently that um, you'll find yourself in that situation and the right answer is to salute smartly and do your best to execute, uh, even though you know you're gonna be shot to hell, as the example that you just gave. Um, and I'm not at all sure that that's not the right answer. Um, but on the other hand, I gotta tell you, I'm not entirely sure it's, it is the right answer. Um, I, I don't know, I'm deeply troubled by this. So, you know, if you're being asked to execute a, a strategy in Iraq, that's going to visit, that's going uh, absolutely in a way that's anticipatable for lack of a phase four plan to be, get, be a disaster, um, at what point you say, you know, I'm not sure I can execute this. That's in fact what General Newbold uh, of, of the six revolting generals, if you will, the, in my mind the most interesting, actually said. He said, you know, I, I'm, I see the war plan. There's nothing I don't know. There's nothing the president knows that I don't know. Um, and I just don't feel I can in conscience be here when this thing goes down. So I'm gonna request retirement early. Now, an interesting question about him and frankly the others as well is, why did you wait so long to talk about it if you felt so strongly? And what he says about that is, it wasn't until I went to the burn unit at Brooks and saw the human consequences of what, what this decision required that I felt some need to speak out about it. Um, so, um, again, there's no therefore to this. It's just, uh, I, I, I certainly understand at every moral level what would drive uh, General Newbolt both to make the decision to retire early and subsequently the sense of moral regret that caused him to uh, feel he wanted to speak out. That leads us to the more general question of retired officers. And I think there are two distinct questions here. One is the question of retired officers endorsing political candidates. In my opinion, that just should stop. I, I just don't think there's any reason that that should be going on. I think it's very, very damaging to the profession. And I think if our retired officer corps had a strong sense of their, the fact that at least in the public mind, they're still part of the profession. And that's just, uh, just doesn't do anybody any good um, except the politician whom they endorse. Um, on the question of speaking, however, I think this is more complicated. Um, in the Revolt of the Generals article, I argued that in some sense, retired general officers who go on as talking heads on CNN or C-SPAN are providing a national service of a sort because um, if they're the right ones, they have some, some uh, relevant professional military expertise, which they are providing to inform the public in a way that a serving officer simply can't. Having said that, 
there are a lot of problems with this. One of all, we all know when we watch those guys and look who the talking heads are, that often the talking heads are not people who have relevant expertise, rather pr not even perhaps from the, the relevant service uh, to be commenting on the particular question at hand. And the public, frankly, can't tell the difference. So um, when uh, we have such a large stable of these people uh, with no sense of uh, are you really the relevant retired general to be speaking to this question or not, uh, maybe in the end it does more harm than good. Because, And uh, to exacerbate that further, about a year ago the New York Times ran a, a, a Sunday front page story saying that in the Bush administration they were manipulating which generals uh, got access to information. Um, so that only if you were willing to go out and shill for the administration's talking points did you get to go to Iraq or get to meet with Secretary Rumsfeld. Um, so if that's the case, that, that what we're hearing from, from re retired general officers is not, in fact, their professional military advice, but really a set of cooked talking points being provided by an administration. That's obviously horrible um, and uh, undermines any credibility that any other speaking talking head may have. So that's a mess, and I don't know the solution to that mess, but uh, um, I, I'm still tempted by my first point that in, if properly used, they are a resource, but given all of the improper uses, it may add up to be another practice that ought to stop. Um, uh, what is the systematic misfit between military and civilian leaders not of the, uh, the, not of the more uh, sordid and smarmy sorts that, that Dick indicated so well, but there's a fundamental disconnect that's of an ethical character, it seems to me, in particular if we're talking about the senior leaders of our services. And that is uh, that their time horizon is necessarily very different than that of their civilian leaders. Um, if you are chief of a service, for example, your time horizon is the welfare of your service at least a decade out, maybe farther. Um, and you are inevitably worried about acquisition programs, budgets, personnel systems that are going to ensure the health of your service way down the road. Elected political leaders are on a very short fuse. They want a result by the next election. Um, and that, that's a systemic misfit between the two cultures. There is no fix for it, uh, but it is necessarily going to be a source of conflict that is driven by perfectly noble and honorable reasons. Um, and uh, I just want to point to that, that um, we shouldn't let it all be reduced to bureaucratic infighting and argument over budgets. There really is a fundamental uh, ethical issue at the, at the root of all this. Resignation. Um, there is, as Dick says, really no tradition in the U.S. of resignation uh, in, the, in the strict sense. Resignation would mean um, I no longer want to hold my commission I no longer want to receive retirement pay. I no longer want to be governed by the UCMJ. I'm out. Nobody ever does that in the United States. That's not true in other countries, but it's true in the United States. Nobody ever does that. What do they actually do is request early retirement. Um, sh should they do that? Well, I, I think it's more complicated than Dick indicated. I had the privilege of spending an entire morning with General Fogelman once talking to him about this, and Dick published a piece about uh, why he did what he did, and his answer was very simple. He had had several major incidents about uh, within the Air Force where his judgment was overruled by the Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary Cohen. Uh, the most egregious one, the famous one, was the Kelly Flynn case. You remember the uh, B-52 pilot who was having an affair with, uh, with um, the, uh, I guess it was the husband of her crew chief or, or vice versa, I can't remember. Um, and what Fogelman said about this was, I, I just realized that at, one, at some point, regarding my own service and my judgment about the, my service, the secretary uh, does not trust my judgment. Um, and if that's the case, then he probably ought to get someone whose judgment he does respect. And so I respectfully request that I retire and go out and live in Drago, Colorado, and uh, let you get somebody who you think more highly of. Now, uh, I'm, I'd like to hear more from Dick about that situation May, not necessarily regarding the service, but perhaps regarding uh, operational decisions as well. I certainly understand all of the weight of everything you said to the contrary. Um, but at what point does a person who really doesn't believe in the mission or doesn't believe in, um, in the policy um, and who feels that they can in conscience and sincerely and faithfully and energetically execute it, rightly conclude maybe I'm not the right guy? Maybe you ought to get somebody who has more confidence in this than I do. 
Um, last point I would say about General Keene. Um, General Keene uh, gave a talk at Leavenworth in the fall, which was uh, refreshing for its br brutal candor about all this. There's nothing negative that Dick said about General Keene that he himself wouldn't acknowledge as a very fair criticism. Um, his view was uh, this was an emergency. Iraq was going to fail. Um, and working through the chain of command was not going to fix it. Um, and he, he furthermore articulated um, he was offered two positions in the administration. He was offered to go back in uniform to command the surge, which he declined. And he was offered to, to go to the White House in a civilian position to oversee both Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, which he declined. And the reasons for this were personal. I mean, having to do with his wife's health, but also, frankly, and he said this himself, having to do with the fact he was making big bucks on corporate boards at this point and financially couldn't take the hit in, in his mind. Uh, now, he himself would say, what do you say about the ethics of this? I talked them into a policy which I then was offered the opportunity to take responsibility for and declined. Um, so, um, I think we have about nine minutes left before we take our break, so let me just turn it back to Dick. Any comments and then possibly we'll have time for a question or two before we get the panel up. Well, that's a wonderful, a, a, a wonderful response, Martin. And and I'd start with General Keene. I I uh, I'll go backwards uh, from from your points. Uh, I I think General Keene is is a little confused uh, about some of these issues. Um, I I don't doubt that he acted in good faith and and with the best interests of the of the country at heart. But I want to read something uh, quoted that he said to Secretary. Uh, Gates um, in 2008 uh, about the Iraq war uh, on the subject of civilian control. And the, you, you have to put in your, in your mind an order of priorities here. Civilian control is one of the most basic foundation stones of our government. And if the U.S. military does not support it, not only in word but in deed, we are in trouble in this country because that means that our fundamental government has been altered. General Keene said, let's be frank about what's happening here. We are going to have a new administration. Do we want these policies continued or not? Do we want the best guys in there who were involved in these policies, who were advocates for them? Let's assume we have a democratic administration and they want to pull this thing out quickly. And now they have to deal with General Petraeus and General Odierno. There will be a price to pay to override them. In effect, he's saying, Secretary Gates, we want to we box in the new administration? We do, don't we? Now, on the subject of, of, of General Fogelman, um, I advised General Fogelman not to resign, to leave, because I thought it was unprofessional, and I thought it was not what he was hired to do, and I thought that there, he, he ought to consult the people who put him in, in office, who helped put him in office. He felt that he had lost his effectiveness. That's the way he put it to me. And what I published was not an article about what he did, it was a oral history interview with him, which by the way, he would not permit to be published until uh, the Clinton administration was out of office. He was intensely, keenly aware of civilian control of the military as he left office. And after he had left office, all the way to, to February of, of 2001. He didn't want to undermine the administration, even though he had um, very little respect for Secretary William Cohen, who was not going to undermine him. I think it is, in, in response to what you've raised, really um, the responsibility of the civilian leader to decide who he or she wants representing an armed service, not the responsibility of the armed service to say, I've lost my effectiveness. Maybe, maybe Cohen didn't think so. Maybe he just disagreed. Uh, General Marshall was overruled uh, in 1942 on strategy for World War II. He and the, uh, and, and the Army and Navy leadership did not want to go into North Africa. They wanted to attack across the channel in 1943. And they recognized at the time that 
Attacking into North Africa would delay the cross-channel invasion at least a year and suck American military resources into, the, uh, into North Africa and then into the Mediterranean where, where the British were pushing for the major effort and thus that this was not just one decision, that this was going to alter the whole strategy of World War II. General Marshall opposed it, said so, but when he was overruled, essentially for political reasons, he did not say, you've got to get the wrong, you've you got to get a different guy. That's the president's decision as to who he wants advising him or she wants advising him. Uh, Marshall understood that. And the political reasons for which he was overridden proved in the end to be more important and more cogent than General Marshall's military judgment because the United States would not have been ready to attack across the channel in 1943. But more importantly, because we had determined before Pearl Harbor on a Europe first, Germany first strategy, and we had been attacked in the Pacific by the Japanese, President Roosevelt wanted American forces engaged in Europe just as soon as possible in order to maintain public support for the Germany first strategy, which was, we all think, the proper strategy. Well, General MacArthur didn't think so, but, but, but uh, the proper strategy for World War II and to delay that buildup uh, in 1944 to 1944 um, until it would work. So well, the point I want to make is, is that the military, sometimes even our best military, is not correct. And that brings up the final principle here. And that principle in civilian control is, is that, as my colleague Peter Fever has so eloquently put it, the civilians have a right to be wrong. That is inherent in civilian control of the military. General Newbold did not know all of the political circumstances. No military leader can because not only is their time horizon different, which is an excellent point, but their level of responsibility the horizon that they see, their concerns, their responsibilities, their duties are utterly different than those of the elected political leadership uh, of any government, which has to put into context uh, military uh, things. You could say it's awful. Uh, General Marshall, uh, President Roosevelt was saying, I want Americans killed in Europe as quickly as possible. That's an ugly way to put that decision on the strategy, but that was what was involved in it. Now, Martin knows that I know General McMaster's book very well. I directed it as a seminar paper, a master's thesis, and a PhD dissertation. So I know the book well. Perhaps I read it better than other people do. McMaster's charge against the Joint Chiefs was much worse than you described, Martin. He, he didn't just charge them with being passive, he charged them with being unethical, that they traded their silence for their service interests for which they had been put into office with the others uh, uh, replacing them. If the civilians have a right to be wrong, the question is, is it the responsibility or even the right, not to speak of the duty of the military, to prevent what the military thinks in its more narrow understanding is going to be a disaster. Do we want in this country the civilian leadership of the executive branch or of the Congress to be accountable to the military? Or do we want the military to be accountable to the civilians? That is what is involved uh, here. I've had long conversations with General Myers he thought it was his duty to get along with the Secretary of Defense. I know it's a counterfactual question to ask this, but what could General Myers have done? What kind of pushback to, do you expect from him? He has told me on many occasions that he spoke candidly, he spoke frequently, he advised, he gave his best advice, and Secretary Rumsfeld chose to take it sometimes and chose not to. In fact, he did take a lot of military advice not only from him, but from his military assistants. So the question is, you know, whether Secretary Rumsfeld was on or off his medications. 
What, what do you expect a military officer to do uh, in those uh, circumstances? Uh, General Franks, certainly not the man for the job. If you read his memoir, his, his scatological language, his contempt for his uh, chiefs, uh, uh, you know, um, what do you expect from General Franks? Did you actually make it through the book? Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, better man than I. I made it through the book, and, and I read uh, 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 Andrew Basevich's 25-page review of it, which is one of the most scathing reviews by one of the smartest historians and professional officers this country has uh, of that book. Um, so I ha you have to ask yourself, what do you expect military officers to do in a, in a subordinate position um, under a system of government which demands that they remain subordinate. I, too, am troubled uh, and am not envious of the position these men and, and, and women uh, in the future um, are put in. Th these are terrible dilemmas. Um, maybe that's why they have so many more lawyers now working for them uh, in uniform than they had uh, before. Uh, I, I don't know. I think maybe, Dick, what we should do is, uh, I think